I actually drew my slides for you guys. Um, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. So my talk is, what the actual fuck is open source, and why am I feeling guilty all the time? Um, and so I, I got asked to come and talk to you guys, and I was like super excited. I'm going to look down a lot, because that projector is mad bright. Um, so, so sorry about that. Uh, I got asked to come and talk to you guys about something I was super passionate about. And then, uh, so I prepared this like probably hour and a half talk, and then, and then I realized that I only had 20 minutes to talk to you, and I've wasted it just telling you that story uh, sometime. So there's a couple of narratives really in open source, and I'm missing a lot of really important events, and I really had no idea what open source was. Like, I created, like I co-created Bootstrap, and I was involved with Mootools really early on, and then I did uh, Ender, and I did Hogan JS, and then I did uh, Bower, and then lately Ratchet, and so I, it's not like I should have a pretty good idea what open source is, but I really had like no idea at all until I was like asked to do the talk, and so I was like, hey, I should probably figure it out because it's kind of embarrassing that I don't know what it is, and then I was like, hey, maybe. If I didn't know what it is, well, at least one person here hopefully will have no idea what it is either, and they might actually buy this horrible talk that I'm going to give. So it starts for me really in, I guess, actually 1960. Uh, there's this company called IBM. You might have heard of them. They made computers. And they, uh, they were pretty good at it. And they are actually so good at it that in 1969, the government was, the US government was like, hey, there's this thing. It's called a monopoly, and you're kind of doing it. And then they tried to sue them, um, which was like a whole deal. And before 1969, they had essentially bundled software, and a lot of the source code was just available. So you could go in there and hack it and do things, and it wasn't that big of a deal. At 19, uh, in 1969, they start getting like, you know, the government checking them out, and so they freak out, and they're like, oh, man. And they, they actually call this event the unbundling or something, and they start shipping a bunch more prepare, uh, pr proprietary. Sorry, I'm like really sleepy, so I can't talk. <laughs> that word, which means not open source. They start doing that, and it sucks, and everyone's really bummed about it. So that, and then by the 70s, really, largely all of it, it's like that, and it's a whole thing. And then, oh, man. I'm going to look back there every time because I'm really excited to see all my like, horrible drawings. Um, in 1980, there's this thing called Usenet, and people like, start sharing stuff on the internet, and it's real cool, and people are really excited. Um, but everyone that does it essentially has this like, moral dilemma that they have to go through, which is like break the law and like, share with my homies, or like, don't share with the friends and like, be a law-abiding citizen, which is the whole problem. And that whole problem really culminates, uh, at least for me, with this one homie that I drew, it was gonna look really <laughs> awesome there. Uh, this guy named Richard Stallman, he actually doesn't have all white hair and looks a lot less like a god entity, but I, when I went to color in his like, hair darker, it just didn't feel right, and so I gave him rosy cheeks and called it a day. Um, and so Richard Stallman at the time, uh, this was, well, he does this thing called GNU, which you might have heard of in 1983. At the time, he was working at uh, the MIT AI labs, and he was like working on OSs and Unixy stuff and doing weird, cool computer nerd things. And uh, he was like, he read a lot of uh, Kant and like he was this big philosopher nerd and doing all this stuff. And then this one day, he actually writes about this one story, which I think is just really hilarious. Which is uh, there's this printer in uh, in the MIT lab, which was like a piece of shit, and he could never get it to work. And the drivers on it were proprietary. And so even though he was this amazing engineer, he couldn't just fix the fucking printer. And so he'd just get there, and he'd rage like every single day until eventually, I think he just actually lost his mind and quit and started GNU. And that's really the history. <laughs> and you can take my word for it, or you can ask him, or whatever. It's true, though, I swear to God. Um, and so we started this thing called GNU, which is the uh, GNU is GNU not Unix. That's what it means. It's this weird recursive thing. And he, I'm sure he thought he was just like really clever in that nerdy, clever kind of way. And he writes this manifesto, which is like really amazing. It's all based around this golden rule that you know do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And uh, free speech, not free beer, which is to say like he wants you guys to give your software or he wants, he wants you to be able to hack on things. Like, you can still charge for the software you're selling, but let, let him fix it if it's bad. Um, so he starts with free software movements, the whole thing. It's really cool. And he actually, he starts off by writing Emacs, I think, originally, uh, which Linus will la later say is like the shittiest editor ever made. 
uh, which I have found really amusing uh, for whatever. I don't use Emacs. I can barely use anything. So, anyways. <laughs> oh, man. Here's this other guy. Okay. <laughs> killing it. Killing it. Okay. Uh, there's this guy named Andy. Uh, I think it's Tannenbaum. And, well, actually, uh, an event that happened before this that was really important uh, is there's this guy named uh, John Lyons, I think. Something Lyons. And he releases this book that it's like one of the most popular bands like uh, computer science books. Essentially, he like prints the entire Unix kernel and then like the first 100 pages and then the rest of the book is just him like going line by line and kind of saying, you know, how does this kernel work? And everyone was like, oh, this is amazing. This is like the greatest teaching aid of all time. Like, this is incredible. We love it. And then the AT&T lawyers were like, hey, wait, that's our kernel. Like, fuck you. And then they banned the book. And <laughs> Unfortunately, for like all these computer science like kids and like people in the universities who are learning from it, were like, "Oh man, this sucks! Now we can't really teach this in class." But they started like photocopying it and passing it around and teaching it in the back of labs and doing all this sneaky stuff, until this guy came up and he was like, "Oh man, I got this idea! I'll just write another kernel called Minix, and it'll be a little cute little kernel. That's why it's so cute looking there." Um, he probably would be incredibly <laughs> pissed off if he saw this drawing I did of him, and. He writes this thing and he has a, compan a companion book for the kernel and people start like learning a lot from this and teaching it around the universities and actually by I think 1990 the Minix like news group or whatever is like one of the most popular ones and that's actually where this next nerd is going to uh, announce this project that he was working on. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So you guys, might, you guys might have seen or heard of this thing before called Linux. And it was actually done by this Helsinki student who uh, turned out to be like really important to this whole open source thing. Uh, and his name was Linus Torvalds. Um, and he, in 1991, he essentially pops up in the Linux group and is like, hey, you guys, I wrote this thing. Like, oh, this is an important point. So I'm going to go back up. Uh, the license for this was actually, I think, licensed uh, to give the copyright like rights and stuff to the book that was the companion book to Minix. And so all these students were like getting taught this class and then on this like how to make a kernel and at the end they'd go to extend it. And they'd write something cool sometimes, but they couldn't really share anything beyond a diff and they kinda had to be sneaky about it because they couldn't like redistribute it and it was a whole thing. And so Linux was like, Puh. and he also bought a computer at the time that he was like really excited about building on and doing things with and all that good stuff. And so he was like, hey, you know, maybe I'll just write a kernel thing. And like, oh look, there's all this GNU stuff around. I'll just like use GCC um, and a bunch of other things and be really good. There's actually a really famous um, back and forth a debate kind of thing that goes on between uh, this Tannenbaum guy and uh, Linus, like right after he open source it or, or like re announces it, in which he's like, two things happens. Basically, Tannenbaum was like, yo, if you were my student, I'd give you an F because Linux is a piece of shit. In which Linux is like, oh, that's not nice. Like, sorry, sorry, you don't like it. Uh, and then he said he wouldn't have even have written it if it, if the uh, kernel that uh, Stallman uh, had initially started wouldn't have taken like decades and just gone on forever. So if you're not familiar, this is a kind of funny story that I found really amusing. Uh, Stallman, the guy with the beard that I drew, looked at with the white hair. Uh, at the time, he was dating this super hot Unix sysadmin girl, apparently. <laughs> named Alex, A-L-I-X, and he was like, one day she was like, hey, guess what, like, my name kind of sounds like a kernel name, it would be really cool if someone like named their kernel after me, like hint, hint, and Stalin was like, oh, I got you, babe, and he was like, I'm going to name the kernel after you, Alex, and then uh, the tech lead at the time was like, actually, that name really sucks, I want to name it Herd, so they rename it Herd, and then these two, this, then Stallman and his girlfriend break up, and she actually ends up changing her name. And then apparently later on, she sees in the source code a comment that's like slash slash Alex or whatever it is, and she's like real happy about it. It's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, shout out to that. So um, I should actually pause here. I wasn't going to do this, but so I, I, made, I made this tweet, which was like, hey, guys, why do you... Why are you open sourcing things? Like, why are you even do, doing this? And a lot of people said, you know, to learn and to a bunch of other stuff. And one guy tweeted, you know, oh, the babes, like, obviously. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Um, but, but I couldn't really think of anyone off the top of my head. And then I remembered my friend Anton, who's dating uh, this girl Pam. And I was like, hey, Anton, like, did you, like, start dating Pam because of J.S. Hint? And he basically said, yes. So let the record show that basically, yes. You can get mad babes from open source. Um, 
Okay, so Linux is going on and it's all pretty great. And then there's this guy, Eric Raymond, who's like a pretty big deal and looks super dope on that big screen. Um, and he's extra American looking. Um, uh, basically, er Eric, uh, he's been like a hacker, uh, quote unquote, for like 15 years. And he stumbles across this thing called Linux. Oh my god, my timer thing went off. I guess that means I can talk for like two hours. Dope. Oh uh, yeah, shout out to two hour talks. Um, so Eric Raymond's like, oh man, this like, like Linux thing is really cool. And there's this thing called Brooks Law, which is essentially the more engineers you have, like the more <laughs> fucked up your software is going to be. And so he's like, why is Linux like not just failing? Because it has all these people across the world essentially contributing patches and doing all this awesome stuff. And he's like, this is crazy. This is like incredibly subversive and really exciting and amazing. Like, oh my god, I must like learn more about this. So he embeds himself in the Linux kind of workflow and like becomes homies with all of these people and does all this stuff. And then after about three years and then about one year of testing like what he thought he had abstracted out in this very like anthropological way, he releases this essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is turns out to be incredibly important and like points out all these cool things that Linux is doing and all this great stuff and he's like look how cool it is, look how cool I am, blah 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 and he gives a talk much like this and this talk is going to influence lots of people I'm sure much in the same way that Eric Raymond changed the world. Um, so at the time there's this thing called Netscape. Uh, you guys might have heard of it, it was a long time ago uh, and they had this browser that they were charging for at the time and it was chill, it was like a Netscape browser, whatever. And Microsoft at the time was kind of trying to push them out of the browser market. They were like, oh, we're gonna give Internet Explorer away for free, and we're gonna bundle it, like, haha, Netscape, deal with it. And the sun sunglasses went down. And, and Netscape was like freaked out, and so like for a year they're like, oh, what are we gonna do? They didn't really care that much about losing like the, uh, brow like the money they were making from the browser. They cared more about the money they were making from the servers that they were doing. And so, sorry, I thought I heard someone do like a shout out, but it was this word echo thing. Um, they cared more about like losing the money from the servers. And so, uh, and f they would do that because Microsoft could do some like weird proprietary shit if they like had complete control of the market. And so they're like, oh, we'll give the browser away from free. And then someone at Netscape saw this talk and was like, oh, that's chill. Like we might as well give the code away for free too. Boom, open source. And, and then like there was Firefox and it was the whole thing. Um, and I don't think, I mean, it was a big deal, obviously, for Netscape to do this, but the thing that, like, was the larger deal was to Eric Raymond. He was like, oh, my God, like, Netscape's going to do this. This is going to be, like, the first huge, like, one of the first huge corporations that's, like, doing this free software kind of thing. And so he goes there with a bunch of other people, and they, like, figure out a, the right license, and they create this new license, even though they were pushing for GPL, like, it didn't work out for them. What comes out of that, though, is this, the idea that, oh, this is our, like, chance to really, like, push like push this cathedral in the bazaar and like push all this stuff out and so they start uh, they actually have this really big meeting in like Mountain View or something uh, where they coin the term open source and what happens is they go through this really aggressive rebranding remarketing of free software to sell it to corporations essentially and that's why we have the word open source today it was literally to sell uh, free software and the problem with free software was really twofold like as time went on like because of like the nature of it for and like the semantics kind of of free being in free software, even though it wasn't supposed to be about like free as in price, um, it became very anti-establishment. A lot of people associate it with Marxism and like also Stallman's like really weird and kind of looks like Marx, particularly when I drew him. <laughs> and so people were like real stressed out by this hippie. They're like, who is this guy? And so they start this open source thing, and it's like a whole thing. And there's a bunch of other stuff. It's really good. Uh, open source. Boom. That's what it is. <laughs> Okay, and then, so then some other thing happens. Oh man, look at that. Isn't that cat just adorable? <laughs> um, around 1999, well, even before this, like, a few people started experimenting with building things on top of open source. So you had, uh, I think it's called Cygnus or something, which was like a support thing built on top of, like, to do support for GNU and stuff. It had GNU in it and the name, and that's the only re like, reason I really remember it. Apparently it had a really good stock opening and then, like, the bubble burst and it was a whole sad thing. Um, and then there's, like, Red Hat, obviously, which did, like, distributions of Linux and a number of other projects. Um, but 
one thing that was particularly interesting was this uh, project called SourceForge, which if you aren't familiar, it's basically like GitHub, but with a million ads and with like a shittier version control system <laughs> and like none of the social aspects and it's just worse in every way. But what's really interesting about it was there was actually an article written in 2007, the year before GitHub was released, which is essentially saying like, yo, SourceForge is like the bee's knees and it's so amazing and like everything that you'd read in an article now about GitHub. And it actually was like blew my mind to read it. So if you search for like history of SourceForge, like read that article, it's hilarious. And then go to visit sourceforge.com and like shit your pants at how horrible it is. <laughs> um, so, so that goes on, and there's like this arrow basically represents Google code and some other things that were going on, um, which is like fine, but I'm not going to talk about Google. And so uh, GitHub comes on the scene, they're like, boom, like uh, this is all on Git, and Git is awesome because it's uh, written by this homie way up here. Oh man, he's adorable too, kind of how he is. <laughs> and you know, uh, Linus wrote Git to work with Linux, and so it's like kind of deeply embedded in this like open source kind of whole thing and it's it's really great and people are really going to love it. All right, this is where my like presentation becomes less about history and more about just the guilt part and it becomes a little bit of a downer, but I'm going to bring it back at the end, make it really inspiring for my homie over there. All right. Uh, so, oh man. That it looks just really good. I've got to say. Um <laughs> Uh, so that's Octocat in front of a star with a bunch of dollar signs on it. Um, and essentially what's, what happened, uh, that, or at least what I noticed, particularly in the JavaScript community, is a new sort of economy emerged with GitHub, a new sort of currency of being stars and followers and watchers, which wasn't really necessarily there in that explicit of a form. So if you think back to like before jQuery and MooTools and uh, Dojo and all these other libraries, that we were probably most familiar with in the JavaScript community were on GitHub, there was kind of an idea, like this virtual relationship of like what kind of value they had in terms of like, you know, oh, this one's pretty popular and it's probably pretty good and like this one's kind of popular. But it wasn't, like, it didn't really become that explicit until things f finally migrated onto GitHub. And I remember for the first time going there and like I had been like a pretty big MooTools fanboy. I really liked MooFX at the time, which later evolved into MooTools in like 2006. And, and I remember like going and like seeing, oh, watchers, like, oh, there's like 7,000 jQuery watchers, that's cool. I bet MooTools has like 500,000. And I went to it and it was like 2,000. I was like, what the fuck? Like, that's crazy. And then bouncing around through all these different libraries, you started to develop this really like literal representation of like how they kind of ranked essentially. And it was really crazy to me and really weird. Um, and what I found that over time is GitHub starts to push this kind of almost game mechanic way of like getting you OCD crazy about this sort of this new economy, this new currency. And so this drawing is going to be really good. You guys are going to love it. <laughs> That's a picture of me with sunglasses on and my hair slicked back. And I have like some really, I can't grow a beard so I have this like fake stubble thing going on. It's really good. Um, and, and so what I noticed is I, I started dressing weird. No, um, what, I, what I noticed was I became so caught up in being like doing open source like a boss, for example, that eventually what happens is I started I stopped or I started to forget kind of what initially had drawn me to open source in the first place. Like I became so caught up in like making sure I was always in IRC and making sure I was writing blog posts and coming to conferences and doing all this like marketing and being like, yo, look at us and like Zach Holman has this for example, Zach Holman has this uh, talk where he's like, oh yeah. Um, GitHub's so amazing and like you need to open source everything and do the big reveal and like I got so obsessed about the big reveal and like making sure I was number one on Hacker News and like that my projects had this like new value so that I'd have contributors that I forgot like why I was really doing things and like what really excited me about the projects to begin with. I started doing MooTools because I wanted to learn more and then the next thing I knew I was just like OCD closing issues and like writing blog posts and then I started doing bootstrap because I wanted to like dramatically help the community and I found I was doing the same thing. I, I was becoming so caught up in like generating this like value which is really this arbitrary weird thing that doesn't even really matter at all and is stupid and I just like forgot what's really super important. And <laughs> there's this other thing that I wanted to point out which is this uh, theory I've been working on 
Uh, this is really complicated, as you can tell by the name. Uh, it's called the cute puppy syndrome. Um, essentially, the idea is that GitHub has made everything so easy, and not in terms of just open sourcing things, but in, in, insofar as contributing and opening issues and everything else, that it actually is almost to like a uh, fault. And so what happens is open sourcing something is kind of like adopting a cute puppy. Um, you write this project with your friends, it's really great, and you're like, okay, like, oh, we'll open source it, it'll be fun. Like, whatever, we'll get on the front page of Hacker News, and it'll be like kind of a fun thing or whatever, and it is, it's super fun, and it's a great thing. But what happens is puppies grow and get <laughs> old, and pretty soon, like six months down the line, your puppy is kind of like a mature dog, and you kind of have this relationship. You're like, that's chill. Like, you're kind of be like adolescent puppy. Like, I can still like you're still kind of cute, whatever. Like, I'll close some issues on you. And then like a year, your puppy is like a dog, and you're like, man, you're not as fun anymore. And so, two things happen. Either you start it, you adopt another puppy, and you're like, you're not like not really feeling you anymore. I'm gonna get a new puppy. It's gonna be way better. It's gonna be really cute. Um, I'm going to like pet it all the time and play with it and not really have time for you anymore, um, which sucks. Um, or in even a worse case scenario, you thought you got a puppy that would be a chihuahua, like it's not a big responsibility, it's just like a little something here and there, but what happens is it grew into a fucking St. Bernard and you're like, oh my god, so much time is like required for me to take care of this thing, which is a crazy thing. Like if someone had told me like, like a month before I open source Bootstrap that it would have 40,000 stars and that I would quit fucking Twitter and I would still have like be spending hours a night looking at issues, I would have been like, lol, yeah, right. Like, no way, this little thing, like, just helps do, do some UI things, no big deal. Um, and so, and, and, and I've been like victim to both of, the, of these cute puppy syndromes. So I've both created endlessly more and more projects that are now turning into dogs. Like almost every project I release, it'll get like 2,000, 3,000 watches, which is enough to have this guilt, which is essentially I need to like maintain this. I need to take care of this dog, which leaves you with this. Oh, this drawing's gonna be good too. This is me with glasses and like fat and sad, sitting alone in my apartment, closing issues and being like, oh, my friends are out having fun and like talking to girls, and I'm sitting here, just IR scene with the homies. But there's no homies anymore. It's just the guilt. And so that's a bummer, <laughs> obviously. Um, and so what happens here is you start looking for the exits. And this is actually was kind of weird sitting uh, like right there and, wa and walking the t watching the talk about inspiration, right? Just even a little bit ago. And the examples were like John Resig and Ryan Dahl. And I was like, man, both these people <laughs> basically looked for the exits. Like they both got super burnt out on their projects and are now largely like not involved in them. And they've either like handed them off to someone else, or they've just disappeared altogether from the community, or they've just added so many maintainers that it kind of looks like they're still there, but they're not there. And a bunch of other things happen too, like people just abandon ship altogether, or they like. <laughs> and going back to the puppy metaphor, I thought this was funny. I was, I was telling this to my friend uh, Dave, and he mentioned that like if you have your puppy and it turns into a dog, you put it up for adoption, you give it to a maintainer, and then he overfeeds it and becomes fat and bloated, and you just sit there and you're really sad because you don't really have time to take care of your puppy anymore, but you don't want to see it fat and bloated, so you're just real sad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens, and it's crazy. Um, and so the final point that I'm gonna make is, you know, open source, that's my Punisher skull I drew last night. This is where it's gonna get positive, you just wait. Uh, Open source has like a very definite life cycle. And I think lots of projects and like everything you do definitely has a life cycle. Like people experience burnout, like that's for sure, and that's always gonna happen. But I think with the like acceleration of GitHub just making everything more efficient and everything easier and easier, the time to burnout is accelerating at like a breakneck pace. And it's insane. Like uh, uh, yeah, no words can even begin to kind of say what it what it is. Um, and so, before I used to, I was going to finish this like fin period, and then like drop the mic and like storm off like this kind of, um, and it was going to be really emo and weird. Um, but, but I promised, <laughs> so Vane, this will be a positive talk, and then you leave here and you want to be super happy. And I, don't know, I thought about something that I think is kind of good. So, originally this talk was going to be called uh, the tragedy of open source, right? And I looked up. 
<laughs> I looked up like tragedies and I started to research them a little bit. And there's this really interesting fact about tragedies, or at least about Shakespearean tragedies, and that there's five X, right? And you kind of build up this quality and then they redeem themselves at the end. And I think the good news is at most we're on like the third act. And so there's two acts left to like fucking revolt and like fix this shit and make like do something extreme and just make it a million times better. Um, I think things right now are getting really crazy and almost unbearable and like you're going to see people creating amazing stuff and that's going to keep happening but you're going to see those creators losing interest and you're going to see the quality of the projects that they create declining at this like crazy pace at least that's what like that's the trends I'm seeing and from like friends I'm talking to that are like in this world and do this stuff all the time and so even though that sounds like a horrible thing I actually think it's a a really good place for like something exciting and new to like break us out of this funk to happen. And I think that France, you guys revolt and do dope shit like this all the time, just fix it, <laughs> we'll be totally fine. <laughs> Duh, all right. So it's up to you guys, everyone in this room, and if you don't fix it in like a, I don't know, like a month or something, I'm fucking out. <laughs> and I'm just gonna be real upset at you guys. I might not visit as often. I probably still will, it'll be, to be true. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's France, come on. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much.